A few years ago, uh, the child of a couple that Catherine and I uh, know very, very well, the child had a, a horrific accident, a really horrible accident. The family were at the beach at the time, and the boy, who was about five, I think, he wandered off unnoticed in the direction of the hotel that they were staying in. And, you know, quite a few minutes went by before the parents realised that the, the boy had gone. And so they quickly began frantically to try and find him, only to find him uh, lying face down in the hotel swimming pool. And so you, you can imagine, I think, maybe uh, the panic that ensued at that point. You know, the paramedics were phoned and the ambulance came and the boy was, he was whisked off to hospital where miraculously uh, that child made a, com a full and complete uh, recovery. But the mum in that, in that family... Uh, Every time she sort of retells this story, and she tells the story a lot, uh, every time she says that she thanks God for that event. Like, the obvious thing is she thanks God for the way that he healed and, and rescued her little boy. But she actually says that she thanks God that in that moment, God showed her a new, like, the intensity of the love that she had for a boy. Like she said, in amongst all of that chaos that was going on, all that just a panic, there was just like this moment of uh, just epiphany there where God really revealed how she has to care for this boy, look after this boy, love this, this, this little child. Now I'm saying to you tonight, wouldn't it be like that for Hannah? You know, the hero of our story. I mean, what's just happened if you were here last week? She's got the child. That's the child that she's wanted for so long. Isn't it? You know, and this, this child that she's, she's been waiting for, this child that she's been bullied about, this child that she's been crying out to God for, wouldn't she love little Samuel? Don't you think so? Would she just be filled with love for this little boy? At last she's got the little child. And then, hang on, what's just happened? What just happened is we've come into First Samuel chapter 2. She's taken this child and she's had to hand it over for temple service. Now, get your head around what that means. It means that this little beloved little child is no longer going to be living with Hannah. And it means that this child is no longer even going to be able to be cared for by Hannah. It means that Hannah is only seldom going to see this little child. Can you imagine that? Can you? I'm beginning to think maybe it's only the mums at London City Presbyterian Church who could even begin to imagine how Hannah must have felt at that point. Yes? Now, get this. Despite that sort of separation, what is it you've got in front of you this evening? Isn't it remarkable? This is a prayer of joy. I find that truly staggering. Like this woman who loves this little, and it's just been weaned. I mean, this is a young little boy, and she loves him, waits for him, hands him over, and yet, this is a woman who is able to rejoice. Now, if you're asking, as I have asked in the past, how is it possible that Hannah is filled with joy at the moment? I think the first line of her prayer gives you the answer. Have a look at the first line of the prayer. Do you see it? She says, my heart exalts or my heart rejoices in the Lord. Friends, do you see it? This is a joy that could only possibly come from God. It's a joy that comes from him. It's a joy that's rooted in God. So this evening, this is what I want us to do. I want us to consider what it is about our God that could possibly make Hannah rejoice. And to ask what we learn from that about you and I finding joy in hard times. Finding joy in hard times. 
Okay, and I think there's, there's just a few things here that we, we see from Hannah. First thing is this. Uh, we see that, that Hannah rejoices in God's unique holiness. So she rejoices, but she rejoices in God's unique holiness. Now, you know as well as I do that there is this sort of common narrative about faith in the United Kingdom just now. In fact, Layla in the prayer meeting uh, prior uh, to the service was praying about this common narrative and we hadn't discussed this in advance. But it's the narrative really that, you know, people say all faiths essentially, they're all the same. You know, people in Britain, the culture today will say, well, we don't believe there is a God, but if there is a God, there's one God, and all faiths are effectively, essentially, they're all kind of the same. You've heard this, I'm sure. Now, you'll see that that there is completely at odds with what Hannah prays here. Would you uh, look at verse 2 with me and look at the middle line of verse 2. She says to God in prayer, she says, there is none besides you. None besides you. Do you see what this is? This is a clear declaration in scripture of the uniqueness of the God of the Bible. There is no other gods. There is none besides you, O God. But you'll also see that on either side of that, Hannah makes even greater claims or greater details. Look, at, look above that. Look at the first line of verse 2. She says, there is none holy like the Lord. Do you see the difference? She's not just saying that the Lord is incomparable. She's saying the Lord is incomparably righteous. Her God knows nothing of corruption, knows nothing of evil, nothing of, of sin at all. And then look at the other side of the line. Look at the bottom line in verse 2. She says, there is no rock like our God. Now, you're familiar with that, aren't you? I mean, that's a common metaphor in Scripture for the, the strength of God, for the protection that God provides. Like, do you see what you've got here? I mean, this is Hannah, and she's praying publicly at Shiloh and I'm asking you is she distressed even after what's happened is she weeping look at it like she's, she's rejoicing she's delighting in the unique transcendence of of her God so it's a it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's an epic picture it's a wonderful picture but do you know what I find most encouraging about the whole thing there's three letters it's the pronoun at the end of verse 2. I mean, I, I do almost think that Hannah is speaking directly to you almost. Do you see what she says here? She says all these wonderful things, the holiness, the righteousness, the uniqueness of God. What does she say? She doesn't just say it's off. She doesn't say these things of the God or our God or, or God. What does she say? Do you see what she says? She says that's true of our God. And I want you to consider that for a moment, because it may be tonight that you've come in here and as a Christian you are racked with doubt. I hear that a lot. You know, maybe it is that you, you, at this stage you're wondering, see the stuff we heard this morning, is it true? This news of the gospel, the cross, did it really happen? Is, is Christianity real? And do you see what God is saying to you here? He's saying that God that we worship this evening is both real and he's righteous. You know, he's both the one living God where all of the other supposed deities out there, they're dead. They're deaf, they're worthless, they're dumb. And God, this God of the Bible is living. But it's more than that. He is a good God. Like he is a God who cherishes and pursues and protects ethical, moral virtue. You see it? Your God, my God, our God, he is both real and he's righteous. But maybe we've got to ask a question. Because maybe we've got to say, and what do we do? Because it's one thing for, for, for us to say, there is none holy but you are God. How do we respond? What should we do as his people? 
Well, do you know what? Hannah tells you the answer. Have a look at verse 3. Because she speaks to the people of God in light of what she said. And she basically says to you and to me, she says, watch yourself. Look at verse 3. Do you see it? She says, don't talk proudly, effectively. She says, don't be arrogant. Why? Then she says, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. Now, I wonder if you see the message. There can't be any place in our lives for pride for self-righteousness or you know that judgmentalism that sort of creeps into the Christian life no place for that why what does Hannah say because God knows your heart now picture that think of that she's saying this God this God this holy God this transcendent God this righteous God this God who doesn't tolerate evil This God knows exactly what you and I are really like. So do you see, do you begin to see what's happening here? How is it possible that Hannah can rejoice at this? How can she's just given up her son to temple service? How can she rejoice? She can rejoice because she knows her God is real and her God is good. So God's unique holiness. The second thing we see here is that Hannah rejoices in God's sovereign care. God's sovereign care. What do I mean by that? Okay. Let me say the the words you don't want me to say. Let me get technical for a moment. Uh, It's the last thing anyone wants to hear on their Sunday night when they're at church, isn't it? Oh, no. If I was in your shoes, I would say, right, I'm going to switch off. The minister said, let's get technical for a moment. Please don't do that. You see, in Scripture, and in Hebrew poetry particularly, we often come across what are called merisms. Merisms. A merism is where the writer, biblical writer, will speak of the extremes of something, the outer edges of something, to express the whole. I wonder if you see what I mean. If you don't see what I mean, I can say that we actually have a few merisms even in the English language. So if I were to say to you tonight, I've lost my keys, lost my car keys, and I've looked high and low for my car keys. What would you think I've done? You'd think I've looked everywhere for my car keys. You wouldn't think I've just, I've looked in the loft and I've looked under the floorboards and nowhere else. You wouldn't think that. You see, speaking of the outer edges of something to express the totality. Now, why mention that? Because we have an important merism in front of us in First Samuel 2. Because at this moment, Hannah changes the focus a little bit in her prayer. And she begins to pray about this sovereignty. Not the, not the uniqueness, not the holiness, but this, this so, the control, the sovereignty of God. Look what she says in verse 6. She, she speaks about God's control over the moment of, do you see it, the moment of death. And then she speaks of God's control over the moment of birth. Now, wait a minute. Do you see if that's a merism? Do you see what, what, what Hannah is praying there, really? She's not praying that just that God has control over the point of birth and the point of... Do you see what she's saying? She's saying that her God has sovereign control over every single element of human life. I mean, she's praying, acknowledging that our God has control over every imaginable area of human existence. All, everything in human life falls under the control of this almighty sovereign God. And, and, and just in case you don't get that, you know what Hannah does? Hannah's right, got to underline it. Look what she goes on to say, verse 6. She says, God is the one who brings people down to Sheol. You know what Sheol is, don't we? The place of death in the Old Testament. It's the grave in the Old Testament. God has power to bring people down to death. And, carry on, he is the one with power to raise them out of the grave. Friends, I wonder if you see the message that Hannah's given us tonight. It is that your God is sovereign. 
your God is God. That there is nothing in all of this universe. Like there's, there's nothing in the planets. I mean, there's nothing in, in the stars, millions of galaxies away. There is nothing on this whole earth. There is nothing in this whole country, this whole city, nothing in this church. There is nothing in your life, nothing that this all-conquering, all-knowing, all-seeing God does not direct and control. Isn't it marvelous? Your God is God is who he is. He is almighty and all sovereign. Now I, I, I think honestly when we begin to, to stand back and consider the scale of the power of, of God, isn't it frightening? <laughs> but I want you to see that is not what Hannah is praising God for here. She is not praising God for his sovereignty. No. She is praising God that he uses that power for the benefit of his people. I wonder if you saw that. You see it in the text. Look at verse 5. It's important verse 5. Do you see why? Hannah's praying about herself. Look at it. God using his power to have the barren woman bear seven children, the number of perfection. Then do you see, she widens out, look at this, verse 4. He uses his power to strengthen the weak. Verse 5, he uses his power to feed the hungry. Verse 8, to raise up the poor from the dust. To raise the needy from the ash heap. Do you see it? She's not just praying God, praising God because he's great. Not just praising him because he's powerful. She is praising God, adoring God in prayer. Why? Because he uses that immeasurable power for the people that belong to him. And if you're a Christian tonight, I want you to consider that just for a moment. Because do you see that this awesome God here, this gracious God, is the God that is active for you. I want you to think about it like this. Um, My uh, younger brother, maybe 18 months younger than me, uh, was something of a child prodigy, music prodigy when he was young. And I was thinking uh, earlier on, is that that overblown that a wee bit? Is that exaggerating it a little bit? It's not really. Uh, I remember his first concert. And uh, there was an orchestra of much older children, and they're all playing. And he was the violin soloist. He was doing the solo from at the age of five. He was doing this. Uh, I remember being there and watching on. And his music teacher at the time, he recognised the talent. So what he did was he took my little brother under his wing. And he really just tried to advance my brother. And do you know what he did? The music teacher was also something of a composer. Uh, So what he did was he composed a piece of music for my brother to play. And then he organized the orchestra. And they practiced for months on end. And then he did the publicity. He organized the big concert. He did all of this. He then went up to the front on the evening and he conducted this as my brother played the violin solo. He did all of that. Why? To advance my brother. He did all of that so that the spotlight was on my little brother. Do you see? That is what Hannah is saying of God. Do you see that God has used this immeasurable power not just to compose creation, but do you see it? He even now is conducting the symphony of life. And why is he doing it? He's doing it for you. God has done all of this, all of it, and he's done it for the advancement of his church. He's done it for the advancement of his people. Do you see it? How cherished we are. And so no wonder... As Hannah here realizes how precious she is and how precious little Samuel is in the eyes of her triune God. What does she do? Even at Shiloh, even at this heartbreaking situation, what does she do? She rejoices. She rejoices in the nature, the character, the power, but the grace of her God. So we see 
unique holiness. We see God's sovereign care. And then the last thing tonight, we see that Hannah rejoices in God's coming judgment. God's coming judgment. I, I hope you can see here what Hannah's, Hannah's done. It, it, it's a theological prayer, isn't it? I mean, she's, she's prayed about who God is and what God has done. And I hope you also notice that she, as she ends the prayer, she casts this eye to the future. Do you notice that in verses 9 and 10? Do you see she prays about a coming day? And it's a day of reckoning. It is a day of judgment. And it's a day where God will protect his people. But it's also a day where he will destroy. And he will destroy all those who have rejected him. But actually, it's who God promises to work through that I want us just to notice as as we close this evening. Because you'll see, do you remember this morning? If you're here this morning, we talked about a shadowy figure this morning. Well, here in the prayer, don't we see a special figure, a special character? Do you see who it is in verse 10? Hannah prays about a king. And that is a king that God is going to raise up, and it's a king that God is going to strengthen. Now, I'm guessing you know how it is. Let's say you're at a Bible study, someone's house, and you've read a portion of scripture, but it's not until somebody comes along and speaks about that portion of scripture that the penny kind of drops and you realize actually what it is that you're dealing with in front of you in the Bible. Maybe that's happened to you. It's certainly happened to me this week. Because you can imagine a sermon preparation, I'm, I'm studying and wrestling with this prayer. But it wasn't really until I read a particular commentary that my eyes were open to the gravity of one of the statements that you've got in front of you, one of the expressions. Because get this. What you've got in front of you just now is the very first time in the Bible that the Messiah is specifically spoken about. Yes, we know there will be a Savior. But do you see in verse 10 how this coming figure is described? The anointed of God. That means the Christ of God. The Messiah of God. First time in scripture that the the Redeemer, the Savior is spoken of like that. And so in light of that, do you see who it is that Hannah is praying about, friends? Like, yes, of course, because of this expectation of kingship that's existed from Genesis. She's, she's praying about a ruler that's going to be appointed in the next couple of years. She is, isn't she? You know, as well as I do. Isn't it bigger than that? Isn't it, isn't it larger than that? Isn't it brighter than that? Because what's Hannah doing? She's prophesying there. The Lord is using her. Who is she speaking of? Who is this anointed king? You know, don't you? The great ruler. The Christ. The Messiah. The king of kings. Now, I ask you, what is it that that king then is going to be like? Well, consider the portion of scripture. Who is God going to provide for his people? Isn't it going to be the rock? Of salvation? Isn't it? Isn't it going to be a ruler who is unique in power? And what's this king going to do? What does she say here? He's going to guard the feet of his faithful. How? By dying? Yes. But being raised out of Sheol by his father. That he will one day come again. Why? What does it say to judge the ends of the earth? Friends, I'm sure you see it. Who is Hannah praying about? Oh, she doesn't see it clearly. She's praying about Jesus of Nazareth. She prays of the king. She prays of the Christ. She prays of the Messiah of God. So I end tonight by asking whether you are in a hard place as a Christian. I know some of you are. And I know some of you are up against it and you are struggling. Can I say to you, even if it is a health issue, do you know that true joy is not even going to come in healing? 
And that, that, that real sort of satisfaction if it is that you've lost your job, the, the real satisfaction is not going to come even with a new job. And if your relationship is broken down, that joy is not going to come if you, you get a new relationship or that old relationship sparks up again. What is the message of this prayer? Joy is found only in Yahweh. It is found in God. So if you're a Christian tonight, then this week turn back to God. Turn back to him in praise and prayer. And if you're not a Christian tonight, don't you see it? Like joy, You know that satisfaction that your soul yearns for? It is only found in the forgiveness that this true king provides. So I suggest all of us in here, we do this just now. We join together with Hannah. Will we do that? Will we worship the king tonight? Will we bow together? And will we allow the joy of the Lord to be our strength? Let's pray.